Hey, this is Brooks with Character Design Forge. I'm really excited about this video because it's the first round of art critiques from just, yeah, from viewers like you. If you'd like one of these personalized art critique videos of your own, it's currently a reward over on patreon.com slash bageldenizen at the novice bard tier or higher. So head over there to get one of your own. Of course, sharing the video afterwards is completely optional. It's up to you. Uh, the people in this video have elected to share their videos with you guys, even though it's meant for them. Uh, hopefully there's something that you can benefit from as well. And if you're worried about uh, being judged or uh, sort of nervous about your own work, uh, just know that the point of critiques is never to be negative or to tear anyone down. It's really supposed to be constructive. It's supposed to help you get where you want to go in your journey. Um, I was at a point where I was a complete beginner at one point, uh, all of the steps to get to where I am now, and I hope where I am now is a midpoint towards something better in the future. So it's just helping along the journey. These videos aren't meant to be exhaustive lists of rights and wrongs, but really just a few actionable things to get you where you want to go with your goals. Uh, also something to keep in mind, especially with this first video that I'm showing, uh, I'm doing a lot of draw overs with red pen in the video. Just think of it like a laser pointer, okay? This isn't supposed to be literally uh, the right way to draw it is this. I'm just kind of highlighting an area uh, or some things that can be improved or fixed. With that out of the way, hope you enjoy these critiques. And if you'd like one of your own, hit the link in the description. Hey Robert, how's it going? Thanks for signing up for this. Thanks for being a patron. Um, as always with all this stuff, uh, I think your work is good and things that I suggest as corrections or things to fix isn't meant to be harsh, it's just to help you improve because I really want to help people improve. So I wanted to start first of all with uh, these two characters. These are really nice. I, I think this purple one on the left is probably the strongest that you have. Um, there's good anatomy and construction. Um, and something that's that's interesting here is that there's consistent dimension uh, throughout the drawing. So like kind of the quality of dimension on the character as a whole. Sorry, bumping the mic there. Uh, and that's something I kind of want to bring up throughout the rest of uh, the pieces that I have of yours. That's something we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, same with the butterfly character here, really like well-balanced. Um, the little story bit that you gave with her that she turns into a swarm or a flock, I guess, of butterflies, like that's something that I grok really well. That all works really well. Um, like a strong, simple design. And again, that same thing here, I'm doing it on the head um, because that's something I'll bring up on some other characters. Uh, but you get the overall sense, like the way that the head is laid out, everything is as dimensional as everything else. Okay, so really like these two. The first thing I'll, I want to move on to here is these human girls. So something I want you to take notice of is the difference in dimension um, between the face on both of these characters. So the face, the way that the eyes and the nose and the mouth are laid out, and the rest of the body. The thing is that the faces are flatter, right? So that they're flat compared to the rest of the body. Is that bad? Are the faces constructed inherently bad in some way? No. Um, they would be right at home on a character that was designed to be flat overall, like a Flash animation character, like a you know, a Homestar Runner, things like that. Um, but because you have the dimensionality throughout the rest of the piece, like there's, you know, there's obvious curves and you, you see the forms and stuff and in, in things like the, the limbs. Um, these shorts have like all of this roundness to them and everything. The face, the way that it's laid out, it's not consistent. So it's really, it's just a consistency thing. So what I would do differently here is just make sure you have a good sense of what the skull is for the character. Turn this down a little bit more. Um, there were a couple other characters that I have picked out here that were the same. So you can keep the same size of the eyes and everything, but if you had kind of the socket layout um, where you know that this is curving around the side of the head uh, and maybe the cheek kind of comes up to meet where this other eye is, right? I'm not looking at this at the, the best perspective, um, but just really quickly, even having the nose kind of come in front of this eye because it's, you know, turned and looking the other direction. Um, maybe the way that this face 
is right now wouldn't be too bad for uh, looking at it straight on. Um, but because it's at this three quarter view and we can see everything as if we were looking at it straight on, um, that's kind of the thing that's not consistent with this. So do something like that, right? Just really simple, but that's generally what you, you want, unless the rest of the, you know, you kind of designed everything else to be, um, that way. Same with this character here. There's, uh, you know, everything's laid out this way. The nose is starting to come over this eye. Um, but especially when you've got eyes that are this big, you really want everything to curve and work the way that it should, right? In three quarters. So mouth is in a good place and stuff like that. But just try thinking about that. Okay. Um, kind of driving home the, the point again here with these two characters like this. So by looking at these, I can kind of tell, right, that you're laying her out the same way, but it just makes it because of the placement of these elements on the face. Um, the face isn't bad, but you see if, if these were just moved over just a, a little bit more, um, it, it's not bad, but you've got the dimensionality like this. These are s huge, like spherical shapes, um, at least like the way that they're rendered and everything there, right? So it they just need to just a tiny budge to the left um with this character here let me drop this opacity down so this is just like an orientation like a layout thing right so if the this mask to me at least is reading where these dots are centered right so if they are centered then the rest of the head needs to be following the same line right because that's how you get things to be dimensional um and it's something you at least understand on a subconscious level based on seeing the rest of your work um but these things need to be like these eyes right they need to be moved um so that they fall in line with the rest of the mask otherwise it instantly like the illusion's broken right and it reads as flat so just something to keep in mind with those, um, on these characters, we've got these characters next. So these might have been the ones that I had the most problem with looking at your your pieces overall. Um, there's a few things. With the pigeon here, um, it's drawn well, but I think that as far as the design goes, the piece that's throwing me the most is this this silver like neck piece here. It's it might be because it's rounded back here. Like I, it seems to me from what it looks like, it looks like it's a kind of like a shoehorn type shape, like a, like a flat round disc like that. And maybe I'm, that's just how it reads to me. So if that's not right, then that's not right. Um, but I think the design would be stronger if this piece was gone or smaller or something else was happening right here. Like maybe even if this, um, because these are kind of like these mysterious sort of um, I'm guessing they kind of fill the role of like that, that very, you know, mysterious, uh, omnipresent type character. If, it, if this came up like a, a big kind of neck cowl or something kind of more like royal, something like that. Um, just because like the rest of the, the character, um, has all of these curves and things. And so it, as soon as it goes flat up here, um, that's something to, to take a look at with these two here. So. I think simplifying the shapes overall would help with them um, and it might help you to kind of balance them and, and see them better. So for example, here with the spindly legs uh, on this character here, for one thing, it, it doesn't feel like they can logically support his weight, right? Because he, he looks like this giant kind of a meteorite or cauldron or something. And then these legs are literally just lines, right? So they don't look like they can they can physically balance him from like a logic standpoint, but just visually from a design standpoint, they're too thin uh, in relation to the rest of the character. Um, so in this drawing, I can't really also tell what the this webbing stuff is doing. Like I can I can tell that there's a this is kind of a cone shape, right? Um, but it's hard for me to kind of just grok what that what this stuff is doing. Um, and so I would I would re-examine that. Maybe it's something that, that doesn't come up in the air so much, 
like that and that that has like just some more thickness to it to to balance the rest um obviously there's there's kind of this fine line with the exaggeration right where like you know obviously you might want him to be supported by really tiny limbs but this is maybe too far out um with the treant here i like the idea overall uh, i like this little eye poking out i would again try and look to draw over this character with really broad shapes and then figure out what that looks like first um maybe things like like just kind of really broad like if you're just going to distill it down into shapes and if, if i were you i would also like use a really thick really thick brush even more so than this um just so you're not worried about the lines and stuff like that um because then you can you can figure out kind of the balance and everything too um I think from a design standpoint, the segments of these shapes, I would like to see you push the idea more um, of the segments. So it's obviously a creature that's growing haphazardly, right? Like it's like these, this very natural, um, non-uniform uh, growth of roots and stuff. And the way that nature goes, generally things aren't like really symmetrical and uniform, right? So I'd like to see just a ton of like haphazard asymmetry in the character, like um, you know, some, some amount of him being lopsided, uh, and then balancing that or like a, a bigger arm on one side or things like that. Um, I think of these, if these characters, like as a race, what you did was you started really small and you were just, you're just trying to figure out like, okay, you want to maintain certain elements consistently throughout all of them. Um, but because this is a race, right, you, you might have lots of them looking different from each other. Um, so like you're you're maintaining the same kind of broccoli style, right? Um, but I think this would be a really good exercise for you is just like figure these tiny elements out and you might surprise yourself with kind of what you end up with. Um, and you might be able to really like, and then just, just take these small things, blow them up as shapes and then trace out sort of the, the overall uh, lines or smaller shapes that go into that, right? Cool. I think you'll you'll find some kind of clever stuff with that. Um, as far as storytelling goes, which is kind of one thing that you were mentioning, um, the whole of your characters they they look good individually. It doesn't seem like they go together, um, and maybe that's fine if if that's executed well. Um, but that's just an observation of mine. There are a few factors few factors that really unify them from a design or symbology standpoint or color or things like that other than the fact that they're all drawn by you, like in your art style, that's about it. Okay, uh, a few things about color and rendering. So let's go back to Beryl here, the first of your female characters. So the green freckles here, um, or I know she's she's like partially a fish character, so I'll call them freckles. I know they're, they're more kind of like a fish scale look. Um, it's a cool idea. At the moment, they're clashing with the red of the hair, right? So this green here, is clashing with the red of the hair. It's on par with the green of the eyes, right? And believe it or not, it's actually also clashing with the brown and the uh, skin tone um, because all of them are really saturated. So that means everything is demanding attention at once. Everything thinks it's important. So if her freckles are the thing that's really supposed to pop, um, then I would say desaturate the rest of the elements and contrast the value. So if I just took what I have here, if I went into my saturation and cranked it down, um, I've still got the, the green selected there. It, not everything has to get desaturated, right? Um, but especially when you've got uh, things that are opposite of each other on the color wheel, the green and the red, um, and brown is sort of a subset of, it's like a dark desaturated red, right? Um, everything is like, every element of that is is clashing with each other so if i if i brought the saturation down just about there and maybe that's too much um, but just as an example and then i came in here and i went back over my freckles um, with that original color so if everything is saturated then nothing is right and it's it's clashing a bit um, or the other thing that you can do is mess with the values so Again, if the freckles are what's supposed to pop, then then desaturate everything else and contrast the value. If the freckles are light, make everything else lower in value or, or darker. Um, or if the freckles are dark, make everything else lighter 
And if you want a bit of a review on the concept of value and everything, you can look at my color video. I don't need to restate that too much here. And I think this sort of microcosm example is something that's repeated a few times over all of your work. Um, there's just a bit too much saturation in some of your color choices. And overall, there's a lack of warm colors as well. So I would, as an exercise, take your work and slide it completely on the desaturation. So if you, so you're just looking at, um, at black and white, right? Um, and do this on, on all of them. So looking only at the values, right, how light and dark everything is, see how much contrast there is and how you could push that, how you could segment things more, and from there add colors that support those values. And just let me know if you have any questions about that or if that makes sense. Another thing on rendering is this combination of black ink outlines um, that are especially thin outlines and the soft rendering inside. So you see like especially here, you've got your um, you've got your thin black outlines right but then inside um, especially on on this character which you've got some some kind of clashing going with the green and purple um, it's this very soft interior so that's again like kind of a consistency thing right so if a comic is being drawn with ink lines the shading and lighting inside are typically going to have hard edges um, but when they're sort of painted inside like this um, you'd want to avoid having the, the ink lines, right? So it's kind of a trade-off. If I were you, I would try either or, commit to the soft shading and completely do away with the lines, um, which actually might be a good thing for you to practice just from the standpoint of practicing the value of your color choices. If you don't have the black uh, barrier of the ink line between, you know, the, the two, between two pieces, um, the value of each color becomes more important. Um, or if you're sticking with line art, pull back a bit on the rendering and just stick with hard edges uh, with your shading. So that's all I've got at this point. I think your designs are seriously strong. Uh, I know you're looking to improve on the storytelling aspect of things. From what I see in your descriptions, you have a good idea of where they're from, um, sort of the lowercase what, the what they're about. I would have to see the larger picture of these stories to get a better sense of them. Um, but I would just make sure that there is an uppercase what. Uh, sort of an emotional core and an arc to at least the important characters. And I'd also try uh, lining up the characters that you have and figuring out the scale of them in relation to each other. So, you know, as you send the art over, and, and this is the same with mine, if you're drawing sort of in the same scale, they're all going to be about the same size. Uh, but sa scale them, size them up with each other, and also kind of try making them into silhouettes as well. Um, and that can actually help you to continue workshopping the shapes that each one is composed of. If you're seeing too many repeating elements across all of the designs, how could you change that? So hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions and thank you again for being a patron as well. That totally means a lot to me. Take care, Robert, all the best. Hi there, Jacob. So for anyone else that might be watching, Jacob is in a position that a few patrons are in where we've actually already had several one-on-one -on -one sessions before. And Jacob's also currently the lone Lamb of Liberation tier patron, which I really appreciate. Um, so there's a few things that we've talked about before, uh, but it's always worth mentioning things uh, that need work even if we've talked about them before. So the first thing of note here is that as far as what you've submitted to me, which is your Instagram, all the work that you have that's recent is from this 365 days of drawings challenge uh, that you did, which is really admirable. And it's a really good thing that you accomplished what you set out to do here. And I also know that along with this challenge, you were going through a lot of life changes. Uh, congratulations to you and Lindsay on getting married. And let me tell you, man, the time that I know I was drawing the least was the six months or so before our wedding. So that's really commendable that you were still able to do that. So now that the challenge is over, and I know that you mentioned a few times that you were just drawing to get something out, and maybe you only had a few minutes each day to do so, and maybe even you weren't happy with what you did, but at least you got it out. Now that hopefully life is settling down a bit and you don't have the pressure of that challenge, I want you to really, really take your time. So time and speed are the biggest limiting factors on artwork a lot of times, uh, or things that are working against you as a whole and your, your work as a whole too. Um, speed is definitely something that comes with experience 
and forcing speed only results in lower quality output. So what I would like to see you do is take as many hours as you need, but if you only have just a half hour or so at a time, get as simple as you possibly can and practice uh, painting, not drawing, painting spheres and cubes. That's the simplest thing that you can do. Um, and maybe also kind of as a sign of seeing some of the things that you've done in your work, um, drawing at a larger size with maybe more control with your arm and, and larger strokes, uh, maybe on a smaller, not as on small of a canvas or, or drawings area. Um, it sounds super boring to do just the cubes and, and spheres and cylinders and things like that. Um, like who would want to do that? Uh, but since you ha don't have the pressure over you to share this work or get it out on a deadline, you can just focus on you. And at the moment, in order for you to get more public and get more people's attention with your work, right now has to be a phase where you're just focused inward uh, with your own work. And it's something that everyone goes through multiple times. I've had several instances like this over the past year, and it typically results in me putting out like less content and less videos, less posts, um, because the goal of what I'm spending my time doing isn't to share, it's to prepare, which is maybe a dumb rhyme. But one of the things that you stated as a short-term goal is to have a large quantity of finished work. And I'm going to intervene and disagree and say, no, you need a small amount of quality work that you really take your time with. So the reason that I say spheres and cubes is that the thing you need to focus on right now is shape, form, and construction. So instead of relying on lines the way that you have been, or it's, it's very... Um, it comes across that way that you're relying on lines uh, really understand the shapes and forms uh, that things take and I think you're a learned character design student so there's a lot about that in the course that you can kind of review and, and go over I think the strongest post that you have is this wolf um, there's strong shapes he has this overall uh, simple and broad silhouette right large overall shapes and even each individual segment has these strong shapes to it, right? Um, really like this a lot. And the other thing too is that it looks like you started broad um, or maybe small and scaled it up. And then what happens when you do that is it looks intentional or planned. The overall look of the character is intentional or planned. Um, you have to give and take and balance as you go. If you contrast this design um, with this actually more recent Rocket Raccoon, um, you get the impression that you started drawing in one section, like say the head, right? And then works your way toward sort of the extremities, um, drawing that way, like like finished the line work here and then kept drawing your lines and, and finishing things up as you moved along. So each piece almost feels independent of the others. And when you do that, it kind of breaks the dimensionality. So right now, um, because of the layout of the fist being very flat, um, even the head, which is in this sort of three quarter view, um, the, the shapes of it aren't really dimensional. And so that reads flat. And so everything, even though it's in this kind of dynamic pose, um, where, you know, you'd, you'd have maybe one leg more foreshortened and, and present than the others, everything reads a little bit flat. So again, no more self-inflicted pressure to deliver or post. Um, it's all about you and getting better. Um, even down here, this this mass effect, I, I know that this is um, like this is either like a, a tracing or a, a, an interpretation of something that is um, already existing, basically. Um, but this is really good because it's not made of lines, right? It's made of shapes. So whatever you did to do this, or even if you were, um, looking to replicate the same product. Uh, and it, it, I think it would be really good for you to do some studies of, of existing art um, in this way. Uh, even if you're, you're looking at it and going, okay, like here's the shape of the head. Notice how what I'm making is, is, is shapes, right? With a large brush and everything. I'm not worried about coming in here with a tiny brush and, you know, tracing out and, and figuring out the outlines of things. I think outlines are kind of killing you. Um, because outlines tend to ruin the dimensionality of things a little bit. So, right, no self-inflicted pressure, less reliance on lines. Um, I hope that helps. I can't wait to see you keep improving and where you'll, you'll go. 
Um, thank you as well for your support on Patreon at the level that you are. That's like a huge help for me and it goes a long way. So looking forward to seeing you continue to improve. I know you can. I know you've got it in you. Thank you, Jacob. Hey there, Minsook. So thank you, first of all, for your support on Patreon. Uh, looking over your work, you have a lot of things going for you that are really good and just a few things that are detractors or things that are inhibiting the rest of your work uh, and a few things that I think can help you. So this advice is purely because you were looking into uh, sort of improving the sharing aspect or having your work ready to share. This has everything to do with presentation and you know, that side of things, the sharing side of things, nothing to do with improving your work. So just to clarify that, um, for most people telling them to get better equipment or buying digital art equipment, isn't a good idea, um, because you want to get the fundamentals down. You can still do a lot without a computer or an iPad or what have you. Um, however, I would say in your case, the biggest detractor you have is in presentation of your work, um, which is a few elements in, in presentation, not just in sharing, but presentation. At the moment, your work, um, especially like your comic work, uh, is drawn on paper and it's inked with pen and the pen doesn't change width uh, the way that a brush would. And then it's photographed with a low quality camera or it's photographed in low light, so low quality light. So for where you are right now, I'm guessing um, you're a little bit younger and that's completely fine. But if you want to share things and get attention, I would do one of the following. Either photograph your work with a better setup, uh, better lighting, better quality camera, or uh, you know, a scanner, getting a scanner and, and tweaking a few things in Photoshop, um, or drawing your comics on Bristol or a higher quality board, uh, or just completely trying to go digital. Uh, so I'm, I'm leading with that. It sounds backwards to recommend getting better equipment. Um, but that would help in the sharing department with things because you want to get to that that point. Um, now on to the real meat, though, the improvement on the art side of things. I think there's a few things that you can do. Uh, for one, like I mentioned, the thickness of your lines is always consistent, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing. So, for example, if you're using a Micron pen, let's say I'm going to go into my settings here and find... Uh, like an ink pen that just doesn't change thickness. I think this this technical pen or this gel pen is, is pretty much what that is. So you see here, even if I'm changing the thickness of the line, oh, I think the setting for this one, it's always going back down. So it's you can tell the difference between something like that where the thickness doesn't change, um, and then the one that I typically use, this oval sketch where you know I, I, I'm pressing lightly, it's thin, but then I press down and it's it actually gets thicker or wider in stroke. So if you're using a micron pen or something like that, and they're always a few millimeters thick, um, and then you use like a thicker pen for like this, this shading area and stuff, this big dark space, um, there's a sort of lifelessness to those lines, um, the lines that are always consistent. And it doesn't help you to grow and learn either. Another thing that's happening presentation-wise is that when you really quickly do this cross-hatching, these lines that are kind of denoting um, the dimension and the shade of, of light and stuff in the drawing, when you do that really quickly, it actually cheapens the look of the work. So in some cases, the drawing that you're doing independent of the cross-hatching is really good. Uh, and then in other cases, it has the appearance of you overcompensating for the work. So like with this Sonic here, if you took away the, the cross-hatching elements, um, the drawing is a little bit flat. And so it, it looks maybe like you're, you're overcompensating for it. So in cases like this, it looks like you did this art really quickly and speedily. Uh, but in other cases, like these two drawings over here, which are really nice, uh, it looks like you took your time. And so the, the drawing is all the better for it. So I would be wary of the cross-hatching using it very sparingly. And I would also try and rely less on lines overall with your work and sketch in lightly the shapes that you're making. And if you got some paint supplies and practice, that way it would help uh, to, to try some painting with shapes. But shapes are always going to be lines, especially when you're learning as far as getting the overall uh, look of things 
and things like improving anatomy are going to be better that way too if you can construct some shapes. One thing that I was able to observe with your comics especially is if you look at your comics really small, which is this is this is how it looked on Facebook originally, you know, the, the preview image. If you look at the page really small like this, you see a lot of com complexity. And unless I zoom in, I can't really tell what's happening. So as a practice, you should be able to discern sort of what's happening or at least make out the outline of a character from this zoomed out perspective. And that's all about composition. So strong silhouette of the character from far back helps the readability. So I'd say instead of all of the cross hatching, things here again, um, here there's a lot of just lines with white space in between them, I would say go in and try to create strong silhouettes of the character from far back. So instead of a lot of black and white all at once, uh, try instead like like as an example here, try and make this, this panel that we're looking at here, try and make it so you've, you've got a lot of white space in the background, right? And then a strong silhouette. Of course, it's going to be black when you're, when you're drawing it this way. And this is just like one broken down character with silhouette. You can, you can, add in the shape details and everything too, but but overall for readability, now look at this. Like, if we zoomed out on this shape, right, uh, because of the the darkness of it and, and the just simplicity of it, now you can tell, okay, well, that's something. That's some kind of element. It doesn't necessarily look like um, a character or a person from far away, but you can tell that it's something, and that helps the readability of it too. So when you stick to really strong black and white shapes like that, um, where there's a strong contrast. Uh, someone whose work does this really well is Mike Magnola, the comic artist. Check him out as well. And speaking of other influences, uh, kind of the final thing that I wanted to have you do is diversify your influences. So look at more sources and study more sources. And this is something that's important, especially when your end product is that sort of Toriyama anime look. Uh, it's a little bit cannibalistic, I'll use that term instead of a far worse sounding one. Uh, when you're studying anime in order to make anime, it's always going to come across as derivative. So look at other art, do as much life drawing as you can. Uh, try some gesture drawing where you're making the overall uh, simplified shape of something. I think you'll want to aim for more simplicity in your work, um, not only because it looks better, but because it reads better in comics and composition. And it's hopefully going to be more in reach for you, more within your ability and skill set right, right now, uh, which will make your work look more confident as a result. So I hope that that helps. Don't stop learning and improving. And thank you also for being a patron. Thanks, Minsook.